undoubtedly, it all started sometime in 1990 with a group of railway enthusiasts with a professional background in the northeast of England. Lovely. I'm the electrical engineer, so I'm responsible for all the electrical systems on the A1 and now on the P2. Since we started on the engine in 2007, the first order I placed, I think, for about £1,200 for the first components uh, to make into the panels uh, that we built for the A1. And uh, we're obviously still buying from RS, and we're now starting to buy components for the P2. And, of course, I'd uh, used RS uh, since I was uh, a youngster for components going back to the, the the early 1970s. Um, so I naturally turned to RS for many of the electronic components that we've, we've bought for the engine. And of course, a key part of that is the certificate of conformance, which comes with the delivery note on, on the back of the delivery note with every RS order. And this was incredibly important to us to be absolutely sure that we know where every component comes from. And if it's a critical component, we need that certificate of conformance. As we talked about earlier, when we designed the, the system for the A1, we needed it to be as strong and as robust uh, and as reliable as we possibly could. Uh, and one aspect of uh, ensuring reliability is making sure that we know where every component has come from. When the engine first moved here at Darlington uh, on a beautiful summer day um, in front of the press, that was just the most amazing moment, really, when this thing, which was just an engineering project to us before that, became a, a living steam engine. The biggest single missing link here was the Peppercorn A1 class, of which there had been 49 built uh, in 1948 and 49. But in spite of a, an attempt by a group of preservationists in the mid-1960s, they were all cut up before one could be saved. The thing we started with, which was basically the reason for setting up the trust in the first place, was the construction of a new A1 Pacific from scratch. And we were very fortunate in the early days of the project of having a very innovative fundraiser. And the slogan that we used was an A1 for the price of a pint of beer a week. And in the end, that funding scheme funded approximately two-thirds of the cost of Tornado, which we reckon in the end was £3.1 million. Pounds. The original A1s, uh, because they were a fairly modern engine back in the 1940s, they did have a basic electrical system on them, um, but they didn't have anything sophisticated and there were no batteries. So when we were thinking about our engine, uh, we, we decided to start from a clean sheet and put a proper electrical system on it. Now we're in the cab of Tornado, and I'll show you a few of the electrical systems that we've got in the cab here. So underneath the driver's seat here, we have what we call the I.O. panel, input-output panel, which is really a distribution board, and this controls all the essential circuits, so these are the circuits that are critical to the engine. Um, above the cab here, above the driver's head, we've got our essential services control panel, and this allows us to control all the lighting on the engine. And unusually for a steam engine, uh, we've got all fitted lighting, just like a modern traction locomotive. Under the fireman's seat, we've got a panel very similar to the one on the driver's side. Uh, it has the input uh, circuit breakers for the turbogen and for the axle-driven alternator and for shore power. And then it has a set of outputs here for all of the auxiliary services on the engine, so the frame lighting, uh, the charging point, etc., and all of that's provided from this panel here. And inside here is a crash-proof data recorder. So if there was a disaster, uh, this would survive the disaster and it records a whole set of data with multiple channels showing the brake pressure, um, uh, situation of the boiler, the regulator position, etc. All of that's recorded on that uh, monitoring recorder. As there are very few steam locomotive servicing facilities left in the country, when mainline steam locomotives are out and about, it's necessary to take a support coach with them. We've equipped it with a comprehensive electrical heating and water system on it, so that inside the coach you have mains voltage in every compartment and in the workshop whenever you require it. 
we have fitted what is effectively a, an LPG domestic central heating system in, in here with a, an 18 kilowatt boiler uh, supplying radiators uh, throughout the coach. Finally, on, uh, in this system, we have a pressurised water system. There are a number of water tanks in the roof of the coach, uh, which feed a mains-operated electric water pump, which has a small reservoir on it so that we can maintain a continuous pressure of in the order of two and a half to three and a half bar in the water system. Uh, we do have one, uh, what some people regarded as slightly frivolous feature, in as much as we have the mobile phone charging socket on the engine. At the time, fairly young chap who has a phone in each ear and was persistently suffering from flat batteries, so he set Rob the challenge, and within a couple of weeks, this charger appeared. And it's surprising how often you go onto the footplate, there's a phone on charge. Tornado operates two distinct market sectors. We do probably 20 to 25 mainline steam rail tours a year. In the past, we've had a long season, for example, with the Belmont British Pullman, which used to be known as the Orient Express. These have proved very popular, and but the other element is we will do three to four heritage railway visits each year, which gives our support and the general public a chance to ride behind Tornado and also to get up close to it because one of the problems when you're on the main line is more often than not when we stop at a station the engine's off the end of the platform so you can't actually see it very well.